So I want to welcome everyone. Uh, our 16th season of the Archaeology Cafe, program number five in this year's series. And um, we're, we, I have found this a really, really exciting and interesting series. Um, and I hope you're all ready tonight for another, um, you know, top-notch uh, performance by our, our two speakers tonight. But uh, we're spread all over the Southwest. Uh, Linda Pierce and I are here in Archaeology Southwest's um, home base here in Tucson, Arizona. It's the homeland of the Tonawatam and the Pascoyaki. And given that our audience is all over, uh, literally sometimes all over the world, um, think about uh, the lands that uh, you're uh, on tonight in the indigenous peoples who you should be grateful uh, that they're <clears throat> that your guests on, on their their lands. So the theme of this year's cafes has been on human relationships while there's human relationships in the dense in the uh, complex material remains of the archaeological record um, and our speakers certainly address those kinds of issues. We're really interested in the human relationships that the study teams, the, the archaeologists and the community members that come together, how they work together, how they find each other, how they share information, how they probably sometimes uh, disagree about the, uh, what they're studying. And, but uh, it's a collaborative uh, relationship that we're really focusing on, processes of listening um, and learning from one another. And it's something that we uh, feel is very important here at Archaeology Southwest in the way we work. And uh, this has been an opportunity to bring that kind of information to a, a broad audience. And we're also grateful for the supporters who make this uh, cafe series possible, the Smith Living Trust, uh, Jean and Eldon, uh, as well as Jay. Uh, thank you all, uh, Smith family, for all that you do to support this. So tonight, um, we've got Louis Garcia, who's over in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and uh, Louis, uh, Lori Webster in Mancos, Colorado. And they've been teaming on the Cedar Mesa Perishables Project. And I really like it when the speakers introduce one another and tell how they've come together. So. I'm going to turn things over to Lori to start the, the program tonight and their, their title, uh, Weaving a Partnership, the Collaborative Journey of the Cedar Mesa Perishables Project. Lori and Louis, uh, thanks for joining us tonight and it, the show is all yours. Okay, well, thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we're excited to share information about our project and uh, talk about how we've worked together. So um, I think we'll just go ahead and, and start with the um, slideshow. We're going to share our screen here. Okay, so here's just a little uh, overview of how we're going to structure our talk this evening. Um, I think a lot of you who have tuned in know about the Cedar Mesa Perishables Project, but there's probably um, quite a few people who are who are watching tonight who don't know anything about our project. So I'm gonna start with a brief overview of that. Then um, I'm gonna talk about our different team members and how we came together as a group. Then I'm gonna turn it over to Louis and um, Louis is gonna talk a little bit about the collaborative work we've done um, with our museum visits and um, also some of the efforts of our native um, team members to uh, revitalize some of these ancient perishable traditions. And then we'll conclude with just um, some final thoughts and, and a little discussion. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and, and start and tell you a little bit about our project. And um, normally when we do these talks, we spend a lot of time showing images of artifacts and we don't have time to do that tonight. We're gonna focus more on people and people working with collections. So um, just to give you some background, the project was established about 10 years ago to document the almost 5,000 um, archeological textiles, baskets, and other 
perishable cultural items that were excavated from dry caves in southeastern Utah during the 1890s. These collections are now housed at six museums around the country. Um, most There's a list there you can see. Um, most of them are on the East Coast or in the center of the country, uh, West Coast, and the closest museum that holds these collections is the one up at Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. Otherwise, all the other collections are, are pretty far away and hard for people to get to to study these collections. It's just a map showing where most of these ancient cultural items were collected. Most are from the area that is now designated as the Bears Ears, whoops, the Bears Ears National Monument. Um, and there's a few that are over in the Glen Canyon area from drainages on the east side of the canyon. I don't really have time to go into the history of the collections very much, but if viewers are interested, I recommend this book, Cowboys and Cave Dwellers, that talks about all these expeditions that went into um, these canyons during the 1890s. The collectors are listed here, Charles McCloyd, Charles Cary Graham, Richard Wetherill, um, and some of their contemporaries, Charles Lang and, and Platt Lyman. Almost all the collections um, that were made came out of um, dry alcove sites. These are places where uh, materials are protected from direct sunlight and rain. It's a dry environment. You don't have a lot of deterioration from mold and fungus and mildew and things like that. And as a result, you can have really incredible preservation of archeological materials, perishable materials. And here's just a couple, a few examples from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. That sandal on the left is 2000 years old. We have radiocarbon dated these items. None of these are funerary items. Um, the rope's about 1300 years old. And that yucca basket that was full of shelled corn is uh, 1500 years old. So you can see that the preservation is really remarkable on these uh, collections and they give us insights into people's lives that are rarely available um, to historians or archeologists anywhere in the world, except for a few tiny, a few areas, the Great Basin, the Southwest, the Andes, Egypt, um, Mongolia, and that's kind of it. So in all these other places of the world, most people don't have a chance to learn these kinds of things about their ancestors. So before we started this project, very few of these collections had been studied or published. Um, some were published in that Cowboys and Cave Dwellers book, but otherwise I think there were left fewer than 15 that we knew of that had really been studied and, and written about. And so when we started the project, the goal was to survey, describe and photo the collections and then make this information available to archeologists, tribal communities, and the general public. So this is our research team. Um, <clears throat> I'll just briefly point out who everybody is, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about the members of the team. On the upper left, Erin Garrity <clears throat> is an archeologist and textile specialist. Next to her, it's me, and I'm the project director and also uh, a specialist in textiles and other perishables. Louis Garcia, who's here tonight, um, who's a Tiwa Pira weaver and a cultural specialist. Chuck LaRue is a wildlife biologist. Chris Lewis is a Zuni Farber artist and scholar. And then Mary Wiaki, who is Santa Clara Pueblo and Comanche who is an archeologist and a perishable specialist. So you can see we have a very diverse group and the purpose of this talk tonight is just to sort of tell you how we all came together um, to do this common work that we're doing with these collections. So um, I have to start out telling you this project was originally conceived as a one person archeological project by me. I had, um, recently finished my documentation of perishables from Pueblo Benito and Aztec ruins. And really what I have focused on for my um, career is working with museum collections that have just been sitting in, in museum storage areas, out of sight, 
that people didn't know anything about and trying to document these collections and make them known. So um, I had run across a lot of these Utah collections during this other work and I thought, you know, somebody's got to do this and, um, and document these. And so I thought, oh, I'm gonna do it. So I started out doing this by myself. Um, at that time, I was on um, Erin Garrity's uh, master's committee at NAU. She was doing a study on um, basket maker archeological textiles. And once I knew that I was gonna be able to get into our first museum, which was the Field Museum, I asked her if she wanted to come and volunteer on the project. And um, she was still taking classes, but her wonderful professor, Dr. Frances Smiley said, yes, you can take a month off of classes and go to Chicago and work on this project. And so she came with me. And so now there were two, and so there were two of us. And both of us, our backgrounds were in um, fiber analysis, you know, textiles, a little bit of basketry, those kinds of things, cordage. But um, there was a lot that we didn't know about, about other kinds of perishables. So we started and um, yeah, we did great with the textile and basketry collections, but then we were encountering uh, worked wooden objects, feather artifacts, um, just things of all kinds of other organic materials that we really had no experience with. And so um, I went to the Pecos conference in 2012 and I gave a talk about our project and I met this person, Chuck LaRue, who was a wildlife biologist. I'd done a talk on the project afterwards, he came up and looked at some slides and he started identifying all these bird feathers in my pictures. And I didn't have the experience working with feathers. And we had just um, finished documenting a 2000 uh, year old twine blanket that contained many, many um, different kinds of songbird feathers. And so I asked him if he wanted to go to Chicago and look at this blanket and he said, yes. At that time, I didn't realize that Chuck had all this background um, replicating um, wooden items, collecting, collecting the wood from different kinds of wood species um, and making replications. I, I didn't even know that when I met him. So it wasn't until we got to the Field Museum and we started pulling out some wooden implements that I realized he had all this knowledge. And it was, we need someone like this for this project. And uh, so he joined our project in 2013. He was officially part of the um, project in charge of analyzing the feather fur, wood hide and horn artifacts. So now we were three and we were a collaborative group, but we were all Western um, scientist people. And so um, we worked together for several years. And then um, at the same time, I had been working on a book for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science on the um, Navajo or Diné textiles at the museum. And we had put together a collaborative group of um, Diné weavers and non-native scholars to do this project. And it was a very collaborative project. We Together we chose what pieces we wanted to examine. We chose which pieces we wanted to put in the book. Each of us had separate chapters in the book. And then for the color plates in the book, each plate was interpreted from both sort of that Western and um, Diné perspective. And I think it was a very effective um, way to interpret. So the group was Louise Diver, Linda Teller Pete, D.Y. Begay, and myself. So this is in 2014 and going on at the same time that we were doing the Perishables Project. And I thought, you know, it sure would be great if I could find some Pueblo scholars who would like to work with us on this project. But I didn't know any Pueblo weavers at the time who really were taking kind of a <clears throat> almost a scholarly approach to studying these ancestral collections, you know, who had not only the experience in making these types of items, but um, the cultural knowledge to be able to uh, interpret, you know, items that were one to 2000 years old. So then a miracle occurred 
And I got this email from this person named Louis Garcia. And this was in uh, 2013. He sent me an email. He said, um, told, him, told me a little bit about himself, told me of his interests, that he was really interested in um, a lot of these, um, these sort of ancestral weaving techniques, including ones that were um, declining a lot in, in production. Um, he was interested in um, sort of the imagery in the Kiva murals. He just had this very deep interest in Pueblo weaving and he was an incredible Pueblo weaver. And, um, and so I got to know him and um, he's an amazing person and um, had sort of all the, um, all the knowledge and talents that we needed for someone to help us with our project. And so we met in a, um, in a diner in Albuquerque one night. I think we met about 7.30 in the evening, um, started showing slides and talking. At 10 o'clock, they threw us out of the diner because the diner closed. We continued our conversation in the parking lot. And then he started pulling textiles out of his truck showing me some of his work and it was like, wow, this guy is amazing. And we just developed this really great friendship and um, became colleagues. And so um, one of Louis's many um, talents, he had been a, um, a native art fellow, the Dubin fellow at the School of um, 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 Advanced Research. And he knew how to make a lot of the traditional styles and was really, had devoted his life really to this. And so um, we got to know each other. And in 2015, we said, oh, why don't we go over to the edge of the Cedars and go look at some of the archeological collections. So we went over together and um, it was clear that Louis was really interested in these, um, in these older technologies that we shared a lot of um, really love for these collections, but approached them from different ways. And so um, I asked him if he wanted to join our project. And in 2016, he did. And that was the first year that he came with us, um, came to the American Museum of Natural History. And um, here's just a few pictures of him. He was really particularly interested in the, uh, the weaving, um, the weaving tools and technologies, and then of course the textiles and things like that. And so we um, looked at collections like that. I think we spent like a week there. And then um, Louis put me in touch with Chris Lewis, who was another member of the New Mexico Pueblo Fiber Arts Guild. Um, I think I, maybe I didn't mention that, that Louis was the founder of this guild. And that I think this guild has really been key to our collaboration for our project. So he put me in touch with Chris, who um, is a basket weaver, fiber artist, also an educator, and um, someone who had worked to revive um, some basketry traditions that have gone out of use at, at Zuni. And so he um, revived the 12 plated, plated sifter baskets there, and also um, figured out um, how to make these pretty complicated um, jar rests, 12 plated jar rests at Zuni. So he joined our project the following year as a basketry expert and a cultural specialist. And so the following year in 2017, when we went back to the American Museum of Natural History, and here are just a few pictures um, in the collection area there. Then in uh, 2017, um, I was approached by a filmmaker named Larry Ruiz, who has a um, production company called Cloudy Ridge Productions about doing a documentary on the Cedar Mesa Perishables project. And um, so in 2017, Chuck and I um, worked on the documentary and we were filmed for the documentary. And then um, after that, I said to Larry, I said, you know, it'd be really good if we got some native perspectives on this because um, we really want to sort of fill out the story about these collections. And so in 2018, 
Louie and Chris were filmed for the documentary. The documentary is not available on YouTube, but if you go to Cloudy Ridge Productions and scroll down, you'll find the film and you can watch it online there on their website. I think it's really good. And I think their parts are, are critical to um, our understanding of these collections and the significance of these collections for public communities. And finally, in 2019, our final team member, Mary Wiyaki, joined the group. She's Santa Clara Pueblo and Comanche. And she's an archaeologist with the New Mexico Office of Archaeological Studies and also a scholar of ancestral Pueblo traditions. She's best known for her revival of turkey feather blankets, but she also um, works with, she does cordage from scratch, makes sandals. Um, and it spends a lot of time doing public education. So she was perfect for our project too. So we just ended up with this amazing group of people. Here's just some pictures of her making a turkey feather blanket from scratch, from collecting the yucca, making the cordage, um, collecting the feathers from a turkey carcass to making the feather cordage and the blanket. She's just amazing. Okay, so that's sort of a, a quick um, story of how we came together as a group. And now I'm going to turn this over to Louie, and he's going to talk about some of the trips we've done and some of the collections we've looked at and sort of um, give you things from his perspective about this. <clears throat> okay, Hinomamkima, good evening, everybody. And thank you, Lori, for that thorough background of the project and all of our members. Um, as uh, was mentioned earlier, uh, when I when I uh, met Lori, um, was actually, uh, I was commissioned by a local museum here in Albuquerque to create a textile that uh, would reflect um, the time period of uh, European contact in the Southwest with a Tiwa leader um, that was going to be on a new permanent exhibit in this museum. And so I uh, reached out to some uh, uh, friend of mine, um, archaeologist that I knew, who um, shared Lori's um, contact information with me. And so we were able to connect. And um, as uh, she explained, we just kind of hit it off and really just had this common interest and passion for um, this, uh, for these collections and the art in and of itself. And um, it just kind of set, set everything up for this amazing um, synergism that we were able to, um, you know, share our, our uh, professional knowledge and cultural knowledge to complement each other, which I think is, was a, uh, really unique in uh, this collaboration and has kind of, and I think could be a good model um, for others, uh, other archeologists to follow. And we've seen more of that in more recent years through some of the work up at Crow Canyon, for example, and, and uh, others who have kind of worked on, on, on these types of collaborations. Um, but what I can say is that it's really been an amazing uh, experience working with um, archaeologists, wildlife biologists, and um, cultural uh, specialists in these areas, particularly in the area of um, fiber arts and basketry. Um, because as Lori stated, we bring uh, another perspective that isn't um, necessarily, um, you know, may not be um, study wise or book smarts, but uh, the cultural the cultural knowledge and the cultural context of um, many of these items. And um, so as a traditional Pueblo weaver, I was able to look at some of these tools um, and just admire, you know, the workmanship, um, look at uh, wear patterns in the tools were, um, as a as a spinner and weaver, I would I know um, you know exactly where um, the uh, the tools would be handled the most, and so looking for patina, 
and uh, various wear patterns that would suggest, um, you know, how these tools were being utilized. And that that type of knowledge is not necessarily necessarily something that someone without a, a weaving background would would know. And so there were some items. Um, a lot of a lot of the material that we looked at was pretty fragmentary. Um, very rare that you find uh, an, an intact um, textile or an intact tool, but in in some cases, um, we're look being able to identify fragments and identify exactly how they were being used, utilized uh, at some point in the weaving process. And so here we are um, with uh, Chuck, my uh, and Chris and myself looking at some spindles. Um, and just kind of studying the differences because these uh, particular types of spindles are are pretty different from what we see today, but it's uh, but the basic technology is still the same, and has changed very little in over um, two thousand years. So we're we're studying that and looking at at the materials, um, you know, the material of the whorls at the bottom of the spindles. Um, is, is pretty uh, variable um, as, you know, different materials would have different weights and um, would create, you know, different uh, centrifugal forces that would allow um, the spindle to maintain its momentum for spinning certain um, fibers such as cotton. So uh, looking at these items just kind of helped us to gain, you know, I definitely gained a whole other level of appreciation and admiration for um, our ancestors' ingenuity to be able to acquire this, this uh, technology and knowledge and be able to continue moving it forward um, through today. Um, so being able to, to see these, these tools and, and with the very same wear patterns of my own tools that I've made myself, just kind of um, adds that that continuous link back, um, you know, through millennia, that we have maintained this technology, these traditions, and the and the the cultural um, importance of being able to to maintain this and and the synergy between um, different artists, Chris and myself, and the wildlife biologist, and of course Lori with her, with her archaeology background in terms of, you know, looking at um, eras, time periods of when certain um, technologies um, came into use, when certain fibers came into use in which areas, uh, so on and so forth. So, I definitely uh, acquired a lot of um, that knowledge in terms of you know, getting a better understanding of what, what was going on in which regions in the Southwest and where some of these influences um, may have originated from, um, most of which came from the South, from uh, Mesoamerica up. And uh, that also corroborates with uh, many of our Pueblo oral tradition um, that talks about uh, various um, clan groups that migrated from different areas and brought in uh, particular um, knowledge and technology from their areas that were uh, culminated here in the Southwest. And we do definitely see that evidence. So it was really uh, gratifying and amazing to see how all of that it came together and how um, archaeological science um, substantiated um, all of the traditional, the oral tradition that we um, grew up listening to from the elders, you know, talking about uh, clan migrations and these different technologies and knowledge that came from other areas. Next slide. So here, Chris and I are looking um, through uh, archeological baskets and textiles at the Penn Museum. Um, the Penn Museum has an amazing collection of um, all kinds of material. Again, um, most of it fragmentary, um, but nonetheless, as, as uh, practitioners, as weavers and basket makers, um, 
sometimes it's it's beneficial to look at fragmentary pieces because many times we can look at the inner structures um, to be able to kind of discern, you know, how um, the different um, plating elements, for example, are being um, plated to create the the ring or a textile to look at the different the complex structure of like um, a diamond twill tapestry um, type of textile, which is a very very complex um, structure. Um, but when you have a fragment, you're you're kind of being able to look at um, cutaway, uh, not cutaway pieces, but incomplete areas or areas of where where you wouldn't necessarily be able to study those areas if the textile was complete. Um, so that's uh, was really one of the um, the benefits that we really you know began to grasp. Um, you know, the amazing um, uh, understanding that we could gain as um, descendant artists to be able to um, apply uh, some of these structures and techniques into our, into our own work, which kind of uh, set the stage for uh, replication of certain techniques and structures that were lost um, long ago. Next slide. So here, um, Chris and I are looking at a at a basket uh, from uh, Lake Canyon in the Glen Canyon area, and it's a very uh, deep basket. And it's uh, this basket has an interesting story because when we were initially looking at it, we didn't realize that um, the the weaving elements were actually spliced. Um, it wasn't, we took pictures this initial time and then we were able to, to return again later uh, after uh, Chris actually had noticed it that there were, there was something going on with the weaving elements and he, he kind of uh, put it together that uh, they were actually splicing. If you notice how deep the basket is, um, which is in uh, sharp contrast to the depth of uh, this type of basket that is woven today, mostly out in the Hopi villages. So we were able to kind of figure it out um, that they were splicing these weaving elements. So that's something that uh, we would never have have been able to find out, you know, by just studying the literature, because many times the the pictures in the literature are are not the best. And a lot of times it's only one side uh, of the piece. So you don't get to you know, flip it over and look at the other side and study it really close and follow each element with dental tools to try to figure out how um, things were put together. But we were, you know, I remember we were both commenting about, God, back then they, that yucca must have been real long. They must have had a really nice long yucca back then. But here, come to find out, they were actually uh, splicing the leaves. Um, so uh, that was kind of an interesting uh, uh, background story on this basket, but definitely, you know, had the opportunity to be able to to um, acknowledge the basket uh, in and of itself and its spirit and our ancestors' um, spirit in that and. Um, you know, make our prayers and offerings um, because for us, these items, you know, still have um, a life breath and a, a living uh, entity. So we acknowledge them in that way as we're taught in, in um, our Pueblo tradition. And in that way, um, we believe that they open themselves up to us to be able to, to, uh, to learn from them and, um, and carry carry that that knowledge forward and um, share it with the with the community so it's a really amazing opportunity next slide so uh, both Chris and I Chris is actually uh, my teacher in the terms of these uh, the pot pot rings or uh, carrying mats as they've also been um, called but we're looking at um, the plating um, of how these um, baskets are made, which uh, this technology is actually 
uh, still actively practice in the Pueblo of Zuni. And um, they actually, um, the ladies in uh, Zuni actually uh, were, put the carrying mat on top of their head to carry um, burdens. A lot of times they carry um, hot stews uh, in bowls to the kiva. Um, and they, they use the ring to kind of balance that pot and also uh, to prevent, you know, burning the scalp on top of their head because that stew is hot. And when they take it to the Kiwa, they carry it. They still have that tradition of carrying things on their heads. Um, so we, you know, have this opportunity to, um, you know, look at things up close and personal and study, you know, how the weaver was manipulating the elements to create these shapes and the different, admire the different weaving patterns. And, um, Chris was also able, um, based on, on this, um, this work, to uh, replicate the um, braided rim on the, uh, the plated uh, baskets, which is kind of like a, a, an added rim on, on, that covers the ends of the, um, the weaving elements in the basket as they're folded over the, the ring of the mouth of the basket. There was another um braid around that part to kind of um cover those those folded over ends which was a very um unique thing to um mesa verde as as i understand it and so looking at that we were able to figure out how uh that was attached well not we but chris um he was able to replicate this but it was real interesting like i said to be able to uh actually look at these items up close and personal and really study them, uh, which is something you just cannot uh, get from, you know, looking at images online or in the literature. So it's really a, an amazing opportunity. Next slide. <clears throat> so here we are, uh, myself, Chris, and uh, Ed Jolie, um, looking at a uh, tie-dye um, textile um, from about the 1200s from uh, Lake Canyon in the Glen Canyon area. Uh, we we're just all kind of admiring, you know, the weaving, how fine um, the cotton was spun, um, the treatment of the salvages and the, um, the, the corner tassels on each. Um, on the side right in front of uh, myself and uh, Dr. Jolie, where is the um, the sash that was found with this uh, manta, and um, it was just really amazing because this technique uh, or this resist dye technique is no longer practiced. Um, so it was really amazing for me to be able to actually study the textile and and look at the fine lines, um, the contours of the design elements, the the diamonds across the body of the the textile and really study, you know, the salvage cords, how the, the salvage cords were spun and plied and, um, you know, how they spliced, you know, the different um, uh, elements of the weft um, yarns as they were weaving the sash. So it's those kind of details, again, that cannot be discerned from images in the literature. Um, so again, another rare opportunity to, to be able to you know, put it together and everything cooperates, you know, with what my understanding and my expertise in uh, the weaving of these textiles. Um, you know, I was able to see, uh, you know, how our ancestors were able to um, solve a problem that came up in the weaving, for example, if it's not coming up even, or there were some parts in the warp and weft that may have been a little overspun so they were kind of kinked on itself. And you could kind of see that uh, if, you know, taking a, a close look. Many times we were using loops, which were kind of little um, magnifying glasses and dental tools to pick apart warp and weft and get warp counts and weft counts, you know, to figure out those kind of things, uh, which is a really a rare opportunity if you don't have the actual textile in front of you. But it just was uh mind-blowing to be able to study um these textiles um that up close and be able to you know see 
get a better I, sense for how the weaver or maybe what the weaver was thinking as the, the textile was being woven. So many of the same questions that I ask myself when I'm working on a piece, I can see where um, the weavers themselves also, you know, uh, ran into the same issues as I did. So um, that connection was really special and important um, for me as a as an artist and weaver. Next slide. Okay, so um, the archaeological materials continuity. So the continuities, um, <clears throat> like I, I had suggested uh, earlier, was all of this studying and work um, kind of set us up for um, replicating. Because one of the ways that we, you know, if we want to revive or learn something a little more um, deeply then the best way uh, will be to replicate and try it and see you know, how it comes out if we're able to, to uh, recreate um, some of these structures. Next slide. So another piece to this was also looking at the tools because uh, weaver's tools are very important. Um, and as a weaver, as a Pueblo weaver, our, our tools, are highly prized and valued and many times passed down through from uh, generation to generation. So um, myself, I still use, make and use my own, uh, both wooden implements and bone implements. So very rarely will I use uh, metal implements. I think the only metal tool that I use is this um, tapestry comb um, that I use for weaving some of the sashes. But other than that, the rest is our bone awls or either wood awls and uh, wooden battens, uh, which are the beaters um, to pack down the weft as the weaving is being completed. And so one of the, the things that I really appreciated in looking, being able to look at these tools that are about thousand, between thousand to 1200 years old was the care that these weavers put into making these tools, making sure they were straight and sanding them down so that they were absolutely smooth so that they wouldn't catch on the warps as it's going through the warps and being used to pack down the weft. Um, a lot of the same issues and care and craftsmanship was put into making these tools and just the care of, you know, either carefully wrapping them so that they're not, um, banged up or you know roughed up uh, in storage or when they're not being in use. So these are, are things that any weaver would not just leave laying around anywhere you know carelessly. Um, they're always wrapped up carefully and stored until they're going to be used again. And uh, so I see that our ancestors um, also did that you know just by studying how um, how well taken care of these tools were. Next slide. So again, we see that in the spinning technology as well, um, these amazing continuities from uh, the prehistoric um, bighorn sheep whorl, uh, which is the counterweight at the bottom of the spindle. Bighorn sheep uh, horn was another um, material that was used uh, for the counterweight on these spindles. The straightness of the shaft blew me away, blew me away. 1,000, 1,200 years later, it's still as straight as anything, and it has a beautiful patina, just shiny as if it were brand new. Um, we look at some of the um, historic um, Pueblo spindles, which we see on the right. Um, so we can see some obvious differences there, uh, but, but uh, not so different, um, considering that this is over uh, well over a thousand years of um, time uh, in between. So, but the basic knowledge or the basic technology um, is the same. Next slide. So we also see a great deal of continuity with plating in uh, sifter baskets um, with the same basic, you know, wooden ring, um, the plating of the warp and weft elements and how they're uh, folded over the rim and bound to create the basket uh, for storage or food preparation. 
um, as well as the um, plated rings uh, for carrying mats that were used in different shapes, sizes um, for different purposes, from being bases for um, drums to put the large um, pottery drums on to carrying stews and burdens on the head, um, so on and so forth. So here we see a beautiful example of kind of an older piece. And this is kind of what I was talking about that when there's wear or um, you know, uh, fragmentary, you can kind of see the inner workings, uh, what's going on on the inside to kind of give us a better understanding. And so um, that those are the kind of things that we look for in the, in the ethnographic collections um, to kind of get a better idea of you know, how they were um, putting these together. Next slide. Is this, okay, is this where you pick up or? Nope. Continue, okay. Keep going, just talk about the trip we did this summer. Okay, so this um, last summer was our grand finale trip. We visited three different institutions, the Chicago Field Museum, the Smithsonian Institution uh, Museum of um, Indian uh, Penn Penn Museum. Yeah, Penn Museum and the uh, American um, Museum of uh, I forget the the title is so Museum of American Indian. Yeah, Museum <laughs> of American Indian. Thank you. Um, so we got to visit these three areas, uh, these three institutions, and the collections. Um, Again, amazing collections, uh, amazing staff that we've had the opportunity to meet and work with over, you know, a couple day period of, you know, studying the collections. Here we are, um, the whole team uh, looking at, at stuff, kind of, again, getting up close and personal, uh, making, you know, uh, drawings in many cases, taking pictures, studying warps. Um, or counting warps, um, looking at fibers and at uh, material and the different um, steps in preparation, how they were preparing them, how they even how they would fold them and twist them and put them together. Some of them are beautifully wrapped in corn husk, for example. So amazing hanks of beautifully spun cotton string that are folded on itself in these amazing shapes and then wrapped in corn husk is just really kind of gives us a glimpse into how um, our ancestors, the care that our ancestors took in um, creating um, the basic materials, gathering and, and preparing the materials and then weaving ultimately um, gives, just gave us a whole new appreciation for each step in the process. And then of course the, the final product. Next slide. So looking at uh, the other piece to, you know, looking at the prehistoric collections is looking at the ethnographic or the historic collections um, has also kind of helped us to see some of those continuities. Um, some of these items, um, several hundred years old, um, we definitely see some things that you know, if we put the historic with the prehistoric side by side, there's almost no change. And then other things where you can see some things that have changed over time. But uh, being able to have that opportunity to look at those commonalities and those differences definitely gave us another perspective and appreciation for um, the continuities. Next slide. Here we are again, studying up close, taking images. Uh, pictures um, that, again, you, we just will not find in the literature. Um, and much of this information and, and images will, uh, we as artists will, will inform our work, um, either for replication or just kind of applying it um, into the work that we do for, um, for our, for community use or also uh, for the market. And, um, and that is just something that's really uh, important for us as artists to be able to, to do. Next slide. Okay, so th these are two replicas um, that uh, since my work began with Lori, 
several years ago, um, I was able to participate in a project to replicate the uh, Arizona Open Work shirt, also known as the Tonto shirt. I collaborated with uh, Sprang artist Carol James out of Canada um, to replicate um, this open work shirt, which I'm sure many of you uh, will recognize. Uh, this, uh, I grew the cotton of this uh, shirt and spun 3,000 yards and plied that into 1,500 yards of uh, two ply yarn to create this replica. And uh, so now this is in the uh, Arizona State Museum, along with the original. The original is um, no longer available uh, to be studied, um, but we have this amazing um, replica that uh, is available for study. And uh, so I'm grateful to have been able to participate in uh, creating um, this replica, which will be available from now on for anyone who would like to uh, have a closer look and learn, learn more about it. The other piece was the uh, weft, weft wrap open work, which is another type of open work. I mean, both of these um, examples are exa uh, structures that came uh, from the south of the Mogollon Rim. Um, definitely a Mesoamerican influence here in the textiles. Um, but we see um, this aesthetic of open work fabric and this light airy fabrics from hotter regions of the Southwest. Um, but we see just this amazing um, uh, delicacy of the structures and the way the design elements come together is just really um, characteristic of the weaving um, that was being done in that period, which um, dropped off. It disappeared completely um, for over for about a thousand years until um, contemporary artists uh, today. Um, I'm one, Carol's one, and Chris is one that were now, you know, starting to go back, look, study these collections, and then uh, replicate these structures to be able to learn more about them and ultimately teach teach more about them, uh, both within our communities, as well as um, members of the public who are interested in, in this kind of work. Next slide. <clears throat> this is my garden of uh, cotton here in Albuquerque, uh, where I'm growing my own cotton. I've grown several varieties from um, Sakatan Aboriginal, uh, Hopi, short staple cotton, uh, natural brown, natural green. Um, varieties over the years. And um, so I have had great success with that um, here in Albuquerque, just in my home garden. Just this small plot will produce plenty of cotton for me to, to use. And I'm still using and giving away um, seeds and cotton uh, lint to um, some uh, members of the um, uh, religious societies here in the Pueblos who, who request it is kind of have it available for them. And um, over the years, uh, several um, Pueblo farmers have requested um, seeds to start to cultivate cotton again in their, in their home plots uh, on their villages. So that's, you know, I always make sure to make that available for them, you know, for our um, cultural and religious use, which is a very important part of um, the work in being able to make those available for that for that purpose. Next slide. So again, looking at the plated ring baskets, um, the you can see uh, the braided rim around the just underneath the the ring um, of the mouth of the basket. Um, this was one of the structures that Chris was really interested in as a basket weaver. And so he was able to replicate that and get that get that going here, we see another example of it. That braid just kind of sits on the rim and it's just the top part that's kind of uh, goes through where the binding of those uh, warp and weft elements are and it just kind of sits there and creates a really nice uh, finish and an aesthetic look on the basket. Next slide. <clears throat> 
And here, Mary Wiaki is uh, replicating the um, turkey feather blanket. She's done quite a bit of research and documented the process as far uh, down as to how many feathers um, went into making uh, this replica that she created for uh, the local museum here in Santa Fe, um, the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture. Um, so she, you know, harvested and hand spun all of the yucca, the yucca yardage, and then hand wrapped each turkey feather, um, which were several thousand feathers to create this, this replica, but she's a very determined and a very skilled um, artist in that area. We're very proud to have her as a part of our team as well. Next slide. <clears throat> you want me to take over here? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we're just, um, just to finish up because we're running out of time. Um, just to say what our next steps are in the, pro in the project. We have finished our documentation of all the museum collections. We finished this summer and um, so that's being done. So now we're processing the data and the photos and um, trying to make the information more available. So we're working on an NEH grant proposal to uh, upload our images and data to TDAR, which stands for the Digital Archaeological Record. Uh, part of that would involve developing a searchable database and finding aids. And really the goal is to take these dispersed museum collections and reunite them in a single virtual data set of photographs and descriptions. And just to add a little bit to what Louis was saying about how much it, the value of looking at things in person versus having to rely on what's in the published literature. One of the things we've been trying to do with the photography for this project is photo a lot of different um, um, technical attributes of each item. For example, with a basket, we're gonna photo the start, the weave structure, the way the rims are done, because we know a lot of people won't be able to make trips to these far off museums that it's very expensive to travel to. So we're hoping that part of the information we can make available is for people like Louie to really learn how things are made without having to actually go and look at the item. Although looking at the object is the preferred way to, to learn from them. Um, also, we are developing ways to share information with Pueblo historic preservation departments, uh, museums, community members, weavers, and other stakeholders. So we're working now on ways to uh, make our information more available to the tribes. And then our final project, um, we hope, will be a collaborative book that will include diverse cultural perspectives about the collections. And I think we'll try to do it in a similar way to that Navajo weaving book I was talking about, where um, we will, as a group, select which items we want to feature in the book. And then um, certain people will talk about it. And for each item, we'll have diverse perspectives on, on um, how to interpret and talk about and learn from these objects. And then finally, just a um, kind of what we've learned or what we've noticed as a group when we work together, um, sort of the value of the different ways that we look at collections. Um, certainly those of us who grew up in sort of the Western academic um, environment, we have a certain way of looking at objects. We tend to focus on descriptive analysis, documentation, what are the raw materials, what's the technology, what's the archeological context, what's the date of the item. We're kind of looking for um, things that outsiders um, pull together by looking at collections. Now, obviously this is um, an overgeneralization because we are interested in the way people do things but we don't necessarily have the experience to understand that the way that a lot of our native um, team members do. Um, the native scholar approach, which is an insider approach, I've seen, you know, can just see that there's a real strong interest in how these uh, makers manage, collected and process the raw materials, how they, how they solve technological problems. Um, I always see our, um, you know, our Pueblo team members are like, well, how did they solve this problem? Kind of like that splicing um, issue that Louis was talking about. Um, you know, how, it's like, 
you know, these guys are really smart and how did they figure this out and how did they work around these problems? And it's definitely that approach. Um, and then definitely a, a emphasis on how these different items were used and cared for, which is something that um, an outsider, as an outsider, we don't have that background to think that way. And so it's been really, um, we've learned so much working with our native team members because they've really taught us different ways of looking at these collections. And so um, at least from our perspective with our project, these approaches complement each other. They, um, and they really enhance the way that I think all of us have come to understand these collections. So it's, a, it's been a really valuable collaboration. And, um, you know, I hope other people are able to um, find teams like this that are just, that work together so well. Um, Louis, do you want to add anything to this? No, I just um, think it's been an amazing opportunity um, to be able to work alongside Lori and learn from Lori and also share. Um, definitely is, has been a huge mutual benefit between um, all of us involved in the project. So I'm just very grateful and would like to thank Lori publicly for all of her um, insight and expertise and sharing with us. It's, uh, we're, um, we're a rowdy bunch, but we have a lot of fun. So uh, it's, been, it's been a great <laughs> experience learning alongside um, my colleagues. So thank you, Howell. Okay, so that's our last slide. I don't know if we wanna Go to questions or? I'll come back. Thank you, Louie. Thank you, Lori. That was fascinating. Yeah, I mean, we we took most of our time, but that's okay because it was really <laughs> fascinating. Um, I don't know if you, do you guys have a time for a, a question or two or do we need to run or what are, what are we thinking here? Um, I mean, one of the one of my questions I had um, with this project, uh, Lori, with the number of people you have involved in it and the traveling, and you, you mentioned that it, it's expensive. I mean, you're not. I mean, you're not really doing this under the auspices of of an institution or something. How how did you even how do you even manage to do this kind of a project? <laughs> yeah, I think we're unique, and and I don't know if it's a benefit in some way or not, but. Um, we're all independent scholars mm -hmm. and um, we were able to raise money um, from a number of sources. Our biggest grant came from the Bureau of Land Management in 2016 mm -hmm. after Barack Obama had uh, designated the Bears Ears National Monument because mm -hmm. most of these collections are from there. So we had gotten a $50,000 grant from them and then um, I had a lot of financial support from the Canyonlands Natural History Association over the years. And a lot of archeological societies um, came through and helped us with funding. Mm -hmm. And so we, we self-funded this project mm -hmm. and most of our money went to travel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, we would go to, um, some of us would go to places for a month to six weeks at a time wow. yeah. and maybe two or at least two of those trips a year yeah. because it's very time consuming to do this work. And of course it's very far away um, from where we live. So, but we were able to do it. Yeah. yeah. Somebody asks, um, is, are any of the materials that you've been studying, you mentioned that they're not from, um, you know, uh, funerary burial contexts, I think. Um, but is there any movement or any of those materials potentially ever going to be returned back to they're more original home or are they pretty standard set in these institutions now? Well, first to clarify, there are a lot of um, NAGPRA eligible okay. collections, okay. items in these collections. And some, there's already been one repatriation. Okay. And in 2013, um, we were working with Don Simonis at the, who was then at the BLM in uh, Utah and he was working on the repatriation with representatives from Hopi, Zuni, and Akama. And they gave us permission to document all the collections that were to be reburied in that 2013 repatriation. So we 
we did that project, but there's still a lot left. And um, there has not been repatriation claims on those yet. Mm -hmm. um, we would be very happy to work with tribes because one of the things we have done, there's been a big documentation aspect to this project that we didn't really talk about where mm -hmm. we really went into the original field records and tried to pull together as much information as we could. So I would say we probably have a better handle than most of the museums on um, a lot of the um, associations of these items. And we will be turning over our data to the museums, and um, but we're still pulling some of it together. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, we had a question sort of similar that wondering if you, you've been able to improve or correct some of the museums. Oh, uh, we've, we've proved a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hey. mostly museums don't have staff members who are familiar with the area. Exactly. Familiar with the archeology. span And so, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's been a struggle for them and funding has been really hard for them too. So I feel like we've done a good service. And I think when the repatriations occur that we'll be able to, help a lot in in getting things right yeah. well i don't want to ask too many more questions but louis as an artist i wanted to i've got a question for you from from your own practice um one of our attendees was here was you know interested to hear how you mentioned that your 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 own personal weaving and has changed or you know grown and wondering if you could talk any more about that like were there changes in you know, the textiles or patterns or color or, you know, what was it that might have surprised you that has affected your, your art now? One of the things that I, that I uh, gained an appreciation for um, through my participation in this project is, is um, the, the different structures, especially particularly the open work structures that are no longer practiced anymore. Yeah. So we have today, we still um, have uh, the sprang technique or braiding, which we also see um, prehistorically, but um, the Hopi wedding sash, for example, is, is a braided sprang technique um, and is the last and only uh, piece textile that is still uh, woven in that. And then we have mm -hmm. the uh, brocaded sashes which are is another uh, brocade technique, but it's it's different. The structure of itself uh, of that particular technique is a, a warp wrapping mm -hmm. um, technique, um, which is a little different than what we see prehistorically. Um, but I really, uh, you know, find uh, the, these different structures really interesting. So that's why I was really anxious, you know, after studying the open work, uh, weft wrap open work and the uh, sprang open work um, structures to kind of experiment with those and create these replicas to kind of um, get a better grasp on how um, these textiles were, were um, put together and just kind of uh, explore that a little more. And so that's kind of ongoing, you know, I still have that passion and interest but at the same time, you know, I'm still uh, weaving our traditional items, which we still, you know, I still make items available for, uh, you know, folks from the various pueblos who are in need of ceremonial items as well. No, well, thank you. We probably better wrap it up because it's about 10 after seven. I'm going to ask Bill to come back, but this has been amazing. Um, there were a, a, a sort of a clustering of questions, people wanting to know more about that tie-dyed fabric and things related to that. So we'll maybe send those to you and you know maybe we can put a quick answer or something out in our email that goes out with the video or something. We'll see. We do have an article in Kiva about this tie-dye in the Southwest. So. Oh, okay. Is it published? Yeah, it was, okay. I think 2006. Okay, then me, we- me? <clears throat> me, Kelly Hayes Gilpin and Polly Shesma. We will figure I, I could give you that information. And we'll send that out with everybody. Oh, and I did want to mention, and Bill may mention this too, but Mary, yes, is an insanely in incredible. In last seasons of Archaeology Cafe, you, many of you may remember that you she did a whole archaeology cafe on the turkey feather technology, and it's amazing and it's available on our mm -hmm. YouTube. But we'll when we send out our little email saying, here's your video, we'll probably put some of this in it. And I will stop now and let Bill wrap us up. Great. 
Thanks, uh, both of you, Lori and, and, and Louis, for a magnif another magnificent performance in this series. Um, <laughs> Lori, thanks for sharing the way your team was built. And Louis, thanks for being the miracle in that process and for <laughs> being with us tonight. And I absolutely never thought I would see the Tato shirt brand new like that. So that just <laughs> totally blew me away. So again, thank you so much for an excellent performance. And literally a month from today, uh, on March 7th, our next uh, cafe is uh, the <clears throat> Stuart Koyoyumtua from the Travel Historic Preservation Officer from Hopi. And archaeologist Wes Bernardini will be talking about collaborative archaeology and the Becoming Hopi project. So uh, again, thanks for our speakers tonight and wonderful performance. And we'll, we'll see everyone again in a while. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Good night. Goodbye. Goodbye.